Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first and foremost, I would just like I would like to welcome everyone to our event today. Autonomous perspective and knowledge, autonomous perspective on knowledge and practices of politics and book launch for kesedaran diri dan kekerdayan by Ali Syariati. Um, just to note. Just, just as a highlight to everyone that that today's event is going to be conducted as a dui bahasa lah. So we just rojak go yeah, through to Malaysian punya culture. So we just speak in English and also there will be certain languages that we speak in Malay as well. Um, representing to the, representing the host is Tari Hikma. I would just like to extend our gratitude to our esteemed guests today, Dr. Chandra Muzaffa, Prof. Zayudin, and also um, Sheikh Sheikh Asagaf for coming to our event and becoming. And try and and trying to present what their thoughts and share with our share with us their perspective on this. Um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, saya cuma ingin meminta um, kita ambil satu minit satu moment untuk bertafakur untuk kita menghormati dan mengingatilah saudara-saudara kita di Gaza tentang apa perkara yang telah berlaku sekarang satu minit satu moment untuk bertafakur lah untuk yang mesti kita alfati. Alright, um, I mean, I mean, I mean. Jadi tanpa buang masa, I would just like to invite um, Rashidi sebagai host kita untuk mulakanlah sepatah dua kata untuk acara kita pada hari ini. Dipersilakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal musalin Wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in uh, Thank you Professor Dr. Zawdin Sardar uh, Dr. Chandra Muzafa Al-Fadil Ustaz Syed Syed Asagaf uh, Dan juga uh, fellow participant our today Alhamdulillah uh, Syukur kepada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, Mana yang kita semua sedia maklum, hari ini merupakan hari weekend, hari minggu, uh, lot of program today. We have a Pesta Buku in UKM, uh, we have another uh, lunch book in uh, Not Mistaken in Tokusu with Dr. Syed Hussein Ali. Uh, we have another program at uh, Toko Bibliophile with our friends Bess Ali. Uh, we have another program Uh, at the University Malaya, the uh, seminar on Turkey Osmania, and Alhamdulillah, uh, our fellow friend comes to our program today uh, to meet uh, Prof. Zaudin from UK and both a speaker from the Malaysia, Ustaz Sheikh Sakov and uh, Dr. Chanda Musafa. This is the third program on Benkel Elmu Mandiri, the autonomous knowledge, which I be held uh, on two last month. The first Uh, the lecture from Dr. Ken, Dr. Tioli Ken, uh, Sociology Pembebasan with Imam Rasid and Dr. Sahul. And the second is the last month, we have program with Dr. Farishno, uh, Peta dan Kekuasaan, uh, Map and Power. And also we launched uh, the two book from the lead of Prof. Hussein Alatas, the our great sociologist from uh, Malaysia, <coughs> say Malaysia lah. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Prof. Syed Hussein Alatas. The first book is Islam and Islam dan Masyarakat. And the second book is uh, Pupustakan dan Perkembangan Tamadun. And today, the third book from the lead of Almarhum Dr. Ali Syariati, Kud Aghavi wa Istihmar, uh, Kesedaran Diri dan Kekedayan, which is, has been translated from... Uh, from the Persian, from Persian to Bahasa Melayu, satu terjemahan daripada Bahasa Parsi ke Bahasa Melayu yang tidak pernah diterjemahkan ke dalam mana-mana bahasa lagi, either English or Bahasa Indonesia. Alhamdulillah, terima kasih dan juga tahniah kepada Ustaz Syed Syed Sagov yang telah menterjemahkan terjemahan itu dengan sangat sempurna sekali. Mungkin insyaAllah akan ada banyak daripada buku-buku Parsi akan diterjemahkan lagi pada uh, tahun-tahun akan mendatang. Uh, saya uh, tidak mahu bercakap panjang, cuma saya mengucapkan terima kasih kepada semua yang hadir. 
especially thanks to Prof Zaudin Sadar from UK. Uh, when I know that he come to Malaysia, so I call our, our friend, uh, Saudara Hilman Fikri, that he say that uh, Prof Zaudin still in Malaysia. Uh, so I say that I want to kidnap Prof Zaudin lah for today. So alhamdulillah, thanks to Prof Zaudin, thanks to Dr Chandra, and also thanks to Ustaz Sisha Sagov for coming to spend to give a lecture today. Terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Test, test. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rashidi, for the speech. I think I would have to do. I would just like um pass to the session to Dr. Chandra. Before that, probably many here are question are still wondering what exactly autonomous knowledge mean, Dr. So probably like perhaps this session, we just want to highlight certain things as well. Uh. Probably it will be great if, if we can understand where does this autonom autonomous knowledge coming from, where's what's the history behind it. What's and what's the implication or the practices that we can apply in today's your perspective, Dr. Chandra? So I'll pass over to you lah for, for the session. Um, yes. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Para hadirin yang budiman Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Terima kasih kepada penganjur Majlis ini atas jemputan Saya menghargai jemputan ini dan Saya mengambil bahagian kerana Tema perbincangan itu penting tentang ilmu mandiri, autonomous knowledge dan juga kerana ini adalah satu daripada usaha kita membuktikan penghargaan kita kepada almarhum Ali Syariati sumbangannya, sumbangan besar beliau kepada dunia ilmu dan juga kepada individu-individu lain termasuk bekas guru saya almarhum Profesor Said Hussein Alatas. Melalui majlis ini saya juga sempat berjumpa dengan kawan-kawan lama seperti Dr. Zaudin Sarda dan kawan-kawan yang lain. Terima kasih. Saya diminta memberi ucapan ini dalam bahasa Inggeris. Dan mungkin itu lebih sesuai kerana ada tetamu-tetamu dari luar negara dalam majlis ini. Friends, <coughs> the theme of my talk this afternoon is um, autonomous knowledge, the theory and practice of politics. That is what uh, I'm supposed to speak on. I 
Let me begin by saying that um, politics is one of those disciplines which evokes a certain response from people. There are those who feel that they know what politics is, and there is no need for a discourse on politics, an intellectual discourse on politics. There are others who have a different view of what politics is. And if you look at the theories related to politics, these are theories which have uh, developed over the centuries, really over the centuries, because we have had theoretical writings on politics from uh, the beginning of time, a long time ago. There have been these you know, writings on what politics is, and not just uh, Plato and Aristotle and so on, but also, I think for for us here in Malaysia and in other parts of the non-Western world, we should be aware of the huge contribution of the non-Western traditions to politics, the understanding of politics, theories and ideas on politics, because all these societies have been involved in politics in one way or another. And therefore, these theories have developed. We are very much aware of uh, the Chinese contribution to politics and the writings and so on. One could argue that um, even before the Analects of uh, Confucius, there were already writings about statecraft, which is just amazing, ancient Chinese civilization. And it's also true of other civilizations, Indian civilization, and even to this day, I think many of us are aware of the writings of one of the great uh, Indian statesmen, scholars, who was one of the greatest in the earlier period, Kautilya was his name, Kautilya, perhaps around uh, the third century BC, you know, the, when he wrote some of these you know, famous writings of his, 15 books, actually, in all, Kautilya. And many say that Kautilya was uh, one of the persons who inspired uh, Machiavelli. We don't know whether it's true, but you know, uh, but in many ways, Kautilya's writings are more profound than Machiavelli's about statecraft. So that's from Indian civilization. And if you look at even uh, Nusantara, our part of the world, Malaysia, Indonesia, there had been writings about statecraft even before the coming of Islam to this part of the world. So there's a history behind all this. We are not here to discuss politics as a discipline politics in terms of its history, background, and so on. We're looking at a very specific dimension of this question. We're looking at um, an autonomous perspective on political ideas and political practices. Is such an autonomous perspective possible? Does it exist? What is this autonomous perspective? Because that is what Lestari Hikma has been trying to do to develop this notion of autonomous thinking. So it's within that framework that I would like to share some of my thoughts on this issue. And I won't take long, it's just a few minutes that I want to share some of these thoughts with you. Now, the autonomous tradition, as far as politics, practice, and philosophy, as far as this is concerned, we can argue that um, the non-Western traditions, which have been uh, ignored to a great extent, even in our societies. I was a political science student at the University of Singapore. 
in the late 60s, early 70s. I was not exposed to a single non-Western thinker. Not a single non-Western thinker. It was a tradition which um, my lecturers, my teachers, had imbibed in their student days, and they passed it on to us. So it was all about Western thinkers, Plato, Aristotle, right down to uh, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill. That was what we were exposed to. I began to discover the non-Western tradition in two ways, my own experience. One, through my interaction with Professor Said Hussein Alatas, who was professor and head of the Department of Malay Studies in the, at the University of Singapore, but he was not my teacher in the direct sense, but I was a student through interactions with him over a period of time. The three years that I was there, I interacted intensely with Professor Said Hussein Alatas. And he was the one who exposed me to this non-Western tradition, Indian, Chinese, Islamic tradition in politics. And I could see the differences, the similarities too, because you can't deny there are many similarities, also differences. But this early exposure was a very important uh, aspect of my growth, my development as a student and as an academic. The other exposure came through my own endeavor when I started teaching at uh, University of Science Malaysia in 1970. After three or four years, I introduced courses which uh, were unheard of within science, politic, in Malay or political science. I introduced a course, for instance, on third world ideologies. It was something very, very new. It took a long while to gain approval from the authorities, but in the end, the approval came. It's just one example. And I also taught Asian political thought. Again, it was uh, something which was new, given the history of political science in University of Science Malaysia at that time. It was basically based very much on the syllabus, the curricula that you found in Western universities. But these were courses that some of the students, they found these courses useful. And uh, I kept teaching these things for a number of years. And even after I left University of Science Malaysia, there were others who took over teaching courses like third world ideologies and Asian political thought and so on. So that's uh, my own modest background that I want to share with you, exposure to the sort of but I had yet another type of exposure that many academics did not have. I was not just a student of politics, I had entered politics. This was in uh, 1997. I helped to found a political party, which is still around. I was the first deputy president of that political party, a party <coughs> inspired by the present prime minister of Malaysia, Anwar Ibrahim. President of the party was his wife, Dr. Wan Aziza, and I was the deputy president. I was not uh, long in politics, <laughs> it was a very short while, about two and a half years left. Like my teacher, Professor Said Hussein Alatas, too, was in politics for a very short while. And I remember the late Prof. Said Hussein telling me once, this was before I joined politics when I was still a student and undergraduate. He said, uh, you know, politics in Malaysia, but politics in general, if you want to survive in politics, you have to become a crocodile. You have to become a crocodile if you want to survive in politics. 
Otherwise, you'll get eaten up by the crocodiles. Or, if you become a crocodile, you'll be able to at least survive for a few years. If you're not prepared to become a crocodile and you don't want to be eaten by crocodiles, the best thing to do is to get out of politics. He got out of politics, and I too got out of politics for different reasons, but this has been the experience of some people. But that's politics, the practice of politics, which uh, one cannot run away from. It's there. We can theorize, we can philosophize, but the practice of politics is actually the very basis of politics, and we have to come to grips with the practice of politics. When we talk about an autonomous perspective on politics, the practice of politics and the ideas connected with politics. Let me say this, that when I look at politics in different countries, and having been a practitioner for a very short, short while, I don't think there's much difference, actually. Political practices in different parts of the world. One can't say, for instance, oh, in, in Europe it's different, in you know, Malaysia it's different. There are differences, yes, there are differences. but. The essence is this. Politics everywhere, right through history, has been the contest for power. The contest for power. That is what politics is, the contest for power. We have to appreciate that. Enduring feature of politics, the contest for power. Sometimes you'll find that some ethical norms influence that contest. At other times, they don't. But it's basically the contest for power, the struggle for power. And uh, when I think of um, both my experience and also my academic exposure to politics, political science, I would argue that um, There are certain personalities who are made for politics. The textbooks don't tell you that this is how it is, but this is the truth. The others who just will not survive in politics. One would not be able to stand the heat in the kitchen. You have to get out. But those who have the stomach for politics and want to be in politics, good luck to them. Some of them have made great contributions, as we know if you look back at history. Others have failed miserably. But uh, politics will be there with us all the while. And we have to come to terms with uh, politics. Looking at our societies, and this is the essence of my presentation this afternoon, I think it is very important that we develop notions of politics based upon our history, our evolution as a society, based upon our own experience. I think that's very, very important. And so just imitating, just trying to follow someone else, which is what a lot of people do. You take, for instance, terms like liberalism, fascism, terms like uh, even socialism, the way in which they are understood and interpreted, they have a lot to do with the context, with the society that you belong to. There are certain elements which transcend boundaries, but most, many other elements are specific to particular societies. You take, for instance, Malaysia. You will find that uh, the term socialism has a certain pejorative connotation in Malaysia. Why? Why is there this pejorative connotation, which you won't find in, say, certain other countries? You won't find that in Indonesia. You won't find that, for instance, in um, maybe countries like India. But in Malaysia, socialism, there's a certain pejorative connotation to it. And why? It's partly because of the underground communist movement in the country. 
from the late 80s, from the late 1940s for a few decades. And what that communist movement was associated with, and it's true, there's quite a bit of violence and terrorism associated with the underground communist movement. We can't deny that. This had happened. But it was in the interests of those in power, the British and the Malaysian leaders or Malayan leaders who succeeded them, to paint socialism as a whole as uh, an evil. And they succeeded. Generations have come to believe that everything about socialism is bad. They don't know the distinctions between uh, certain trends in socialist thought and Marxism, for instance, and that is very important. They don't talk about how it has been practiced in different parts of the world. It's not always been associated with violence or terrorism, but these things are not widely known in Malaysia. So it's very difficult to put across socialist ideas as a socialist package, which is why the Socialist Party in Malaya has never succeeded. It's one of the many reasons why it has had a very, very poor reception in this country. This is why I think the context is important. We have to try to understand the context, which is also why if you are committed to social justice and you can articulate ideas connected to social justice without using the word socialism, the term socialism, you may be able to achieve more. This is where I think a certain degree of political sophistication comes in a certain understanding of your context, of your environment. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. It's the same thing with the word liberal now. In Malaysia, it is just amazing. In the last few years, the word liberal has somehow come to be associated with LBGTQ. L LGBTQ. Yeah. Yeah, that is what liberal means, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. The term liberalism precedes yeah. the whole LGBT movement. Yeah. And yet you find that uh, the moment you're supposed to be liberal, they link you with uh, that movement. There may be many of us who are liberal in some of our stances, in our positions, and yet at the same time, we may not support uh, same-sex marriage. But this is the problem. So the context is very, very important. And I find that today, through my interaction with friends in Indonesia, after the unfortunate Gestapo episode of September 30th, 1965, communism and socialism as a whole, you find that it has very few takers in Indonesia. There's also a lot of aversion to that term. And those who want to talk about socialism will have to find other ways, or if you want to talk about justice, you have to find other ways of articulating mm -hmm. ideas of justice. So the context is very important in trying to understand a particular situation. And uh, there is a need, therefore, to analyze your own country, your own circumstances, develop theories, develop practices based upon this. There are, I think, at least three reasons why this sort of autonomous thinking is important, quite apart from what I've just said, you know, because of things that have happened in a particular society or another society and so on. But there are three other reasons that are very important. One is our colonial past. All these societies, we were colonized, let us not forget that during the colonial period, there was actually no politics as such in the colonized country. The politics which people came to know about was actually the politics of the colonizer, of the colonial master. So you'll find that in a country like, in, like Malaysia, what had happened in Britain, its colonial history, its um, tradition and so on, had some influence upon Malaysia when Malaysians got into politics. And the same thing with Indonesia, it was 
Dutch and the European experience and so on and so forth, there is another country. So the colonial past is a very important factor, why we have to develop this autonomy. There was no politics as such during the colonial era. The colonial power had a system of governance. And that system of governance was, to a great extent, anti-people, anti-the people that they governed. They did not care two hoots about how the people were. I mean, we know that for a fact. You see, sometimes we tend to say, and in Malaysia, this is something which happens all the while, oh, some good things that the British did, perhaps. Perhaps. If you look at the details, it may be true. But by and large, the colonial experience had been a bad experience for us, which is why you can't hope to, to gain any guidance from the colonial, colonial experience, even on things which we have taken for granted. You know, in Malaysia, we used to say infrastructure development because of the British. But we forget that everything that they did in terms of infrastructure development during the colonial period was actually in their own interest. They built railways because they had to sell the tin and rubber. And so the connections were all strategic in terms of their economic interests. Even things like hospitals that they set up and the type of um, specializations that developed in these hospitals, somehow they were linked to their own interests. You'd be very surprised to learn, for instance, that um, venereal diseases, VD, venereal diseases, were given quite a lot of attention in the British period. Why? Because there were British officials who were victims of venereal diseases. You know, those who came here, most of the time they didn't have their families with them. And so that was given much more attention than, for instance, a disease which at one time was killing quite a lot of people, a few thousands, malaria in Malaysia, malaria. But after a while, they had to because they had no choice because they, this was affecting the labor force. So there are all these reasons of that sort. In other words, what I'm saying is we have to look at the colonial period in depth and you'll see that it doesn't really offer much guidance in trying to understand things like politics or the economy and so on. That's one reason. The other reason is, if you want to go back in history, before the colonial period, what sort of guidance? The feudal period in Malaysia. We don't formally call it the feudal period, but it was uh, the feudal period. You had uh, rulers, sultans, a whole system of uh, chieftains, and you know, I suppose, the sultans in certain phases in our history, they were not uh, absolute rulers, it's true. This again is a misunderstanding about Malaysian history. They were not absolute rulers. They depended very much upon their chieftains for the actual exercise of power. They were right there at the apex. They were symbolic rulers. They enjoyed the pomp and glory of uh, office, but that's what they were most of the time. Now, I say that the feudal period will not help us in understanding politics and what politics should be today. Why? Because there was this notion of unquestioning loyalty to the ruler. There was feudal, unquestioning loyalty to the ruler, which doesn't jive with a democratic society. That's something which uh, we must keep in mind. And uh, if you look at some of the rulers who abused their power, the fact that they were never held accountable, that again is frightening. That is the sort of uh, rulership, that is the sort of uh, governorship you don't want, where people can do what they want. You can kill a neighbor, you can. abduct the wife of someone else, you're still there in power, and you abuse power in all sorts of ways. So from the feudal period, there isn't much that we can use as um, guidance for politics today, if you're thinking of developing an autonomous political tradition.
So, what are the examples do we have? The post colonial period, which has been a very important aspect of the lives of many of us, the post colonial period. Here again, if you are honest about the post colonial period, the last few decades, for instance, it has basically been politics in the larger sense dictated by the West. They define what politics is and what it should be. And we have followed them in many instances when we talk about politics. When we talk about dissent, when we talk about uh, authoritarianism, when we talk about uh, democracy and uh, various other forms of governance, we just follow them blindly. And this is why in the case of our country, again I go back to an example from our country, when uh, we had our 13th May riots, 1969. And then introduced certain changes after those riots, changes affecting the freedom of expression, organization, assembly, and so on. There was a very negative reaction from the middle class, the English educated in particular, those of us who remember that time in our history. And one of the main reasons was because they felt that these things were not part of the liberal atmosphere, the liberal ethos in politics. For instance, they were against a law, and this is the law that is in the country to this day, which protects the national language. You cannot question the status of Malay as a national language in Malaysia. You cannot. You can talk about its implementation, but you cannot question the status of Malay itself as a national language. As a very young academic at that time, I'd just begun teaching after the riots in 70, 71. I was one of the very few individuals who supported that law that prohibited continuous debate on the national language. And the example I gave was Sri Lanka. After independence, they became independent in 1948. In Sri Lanka, the question of language was so dominant about Sinhalese, Tamil, and so on. Malaysia's situation was different. And that's the point that one has to make, and one has to understand this. In Malaysia, the status of Malay as the language of the land was never disputed. In practice, even the non-Malays actually accepted it. Why? Because when a Malayan, before formation of Malaysia, of Chinese origin, spoke to a Malayan of Tamil origin, both didn't know English, they had to communicate with one another. What is the language they used? They used Malay. There was no official language at that time. There was no law, but they used Malay because that was the language of the people. This is why Malay was truly a lingua franca that the different communities used. Apart from different communities that were part of the Malay community, different strands within the Malay community, but amongst the Malays, Chinese Indians, amongst the Chinese and the Indians, the language was actually Malay. So why should one dispute the status of Malay as the language of the land? It was a futile debate. It was a debate that was, um, pardon me saying this, uh, that became a big issue partly because Singapore had become part of Malaysia and Lee Kuan Yew was a champion of this uh, approach to the different languages. But it's good that in 1969, 70, 71, 71, the amendments were put into effect. We changed that Bahasa should not be questioned. So this, I think, is something that we have to keep in mind, you know, that uh, we have to meet the challenges on our own and come up with solutions without just following someone else. And in this case, the so-called liberal tradition. And even today, you'll find that uh, there are so-called liberals in Malaysia who are not happy with certain things, largely because of their worldview. It is not based upon the realities in our society. For instance, there is a, a bit of a debate going on about adoption now, about the constitutional status of uh, adopted children and so on. Here again, there is a history behind it, which I, don't want, which I won't go into. But these are things which we must you know, understand. Look at our own situation, understand our own situation, and come up with solutions. 
And uh, this is where we find that uh, neither the colonial period nor the pre-colonial period or the post-colonial period, we are talking about the contemporary, the current period, is helpful. We look at these things, we absorb the knowledge we can, but we reflect and we think. The important thing is to think, think on our own, using our own experience and our own situation as our guide, guidelines in trying to come up with solutions to the challenges that we face. So what is the sort of society that one has in mind? So you don't follow some of these things blindly, come up with your own solutions, including, and this may sound really radical to some of us, including something that I had been attracted to for a long while, and when I went into politics, I realized that there was some truth in it. Why should a political party be the main vehicle for the conduct of politics? It sounds outlandish, right? This sort of argument. Why a political party? We have accepted this as a reality. You must have political parties. This is partly because of the experience of all of us. But it's very interesting that Mahatma Gandhi, at the time of the independence of India, 1947, few months before he died, he argued that one should not have political parties. Get rid of political parties, he said, because political parties are going to become very divisive. And that is what has happened. I look at political parties everywhere and I tell myself, what are these political parties? Look at the United States of America today. Republicans, Democrats. A third force has never really emerged. They dominate politics. Look at a country like India supposed to be the world's largest democracy, dominated by political parties. And today, you have, through the political process, the electoral process, an extreme Hindu party in power. And its strength is almost, uh, it's almost invincible. It's very, very you know, strong. And this is the danger, political parties. It strengthens divisions in societies, even in our own country. Ethnic politics has become strong partly because of the political parties that have contributed to ethnic politics. We have to keep this in mind. That, um, you know, following certain models of this sort, a political party and so on, may not be the solution. So perhaps in our case, if one can uh, let one's imagination run wild, maybe you don't have political parties. Have any number of civic societies, groups, individuals with freedom. That's very important. Freedom is very important. The freedom to express your views, to contest other views and so on. Let these things flourish in your society. And when it comes to choosing leaders, why should you have political parties? It is not a precondition. Individuals can contest as individuals. Win elections and then they become part of parliament or state assembly or what have you. Of course, it's not going to be easy, but you can do that. And if you want to have a leader, someone who would head the executive, then maybe you have a separate election for the president of that society or the prime minister. Now, these are possibilities. In other words, what I'm saying is think out of the box. Let us not believe that this is the defining dimension of politics. You must have political parties. That you want to serve society, you want to bring about changes in your environment, you must join a political party. You must stand for elections through a political party and so on. But I'm saying that there are perhaps other ways that we have not really explored. And we should think of this in terms of uh, autonomous thinking. This is the sort of autonomous thinking I think that we need about the nature of politics, of political parties, of contests, and so on. And that brings me to perhaps the most important aspect of the rethinking that we need to do. We have to rethink the equation of politics with power. That is something that we understand. Yes, there will always be this question of power. But the way in which we approach power, that is something that we may need to reflect upon. Why is it that 
very often in most parts of the world, amongst most parties, politicians, and so on, the central preoccupation, whatever they may say, is power, grabbing power, coming to power. Can't we have a society where we have elections, where we know there is power and there's contest to some extent, but that is not the be all and end all. That you learn service, you learn how to contribute to society. Can that be done? Can one get out of this obsession with power as the defining attribute of politics? You have to think about it. And one of the reasons why we have to think about it, friends, is because we are talking about Shariati, Ali Shariati. Not many people know that Ali Shariati had a huge impact upon politics before the Iranian Revolution, and even for a short period after the revolution. But he didn't belong to any political party. He didn't contest any seat. But it was impact that came from the flow of ideas, from the audiences that he developed, from the people who came after him. And this is very, very important. For Shariati, what defined politics were the three S's, S, the alphabet S. Service, sacrifice, and suffering. Very interesting, suffering. Service, sacrifice, and suffering. That is part of politics. That's what he argued. And Ali Shariati, in his writings, when he talked about politics, look at the way he talked about Imam Hussein. That was an example of service, sacrifice, suffering. The way he talked about Abu Dhar al Ghifari, who died in the desert. Again, the notion of service, sacrifice, and suffering. So, this is what politics should be. And I think if politics was motivated by these three forces, I think we'll all be much happier. Of course, the There'll be some people who have to pay the price, but nonetheless, I think the ethos will change. Instead, politics has basically become serving oneself all over the world, aggrandizing one's power. That's what politics has become. So that has to change. And this is where I think Shariati is an outstanding example. He's an outstanding example. I remember Shariati with great fondness, and I'm glad there are others here like Zia, also great um, admirers, followers of Shariati. In 2015, December 2015, for the first time in the history of Iran after the revolution, a very big conference was held on Shariati for the first time. They were kind enough to invite me to deliver the keynote address on Shariati. And I talked about this the political thoughts of Shariati. It's part of a book, and this is a book which uh, you would be able to get, I think, you know, it's uh, a book edited by uh, Dustin Bird and Jamal Miri, Said Jamal Miri. Yes, that is the book, and I think it is uh, a book that talks about, uh, let me just see if I can get the title of the book. It's, it's not here with me. But uh, it's a book on, I think it is, oh, my other bag, sorry. It is about theory, shariati beyond theory, or something of that sort, you know? Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Sorry, Isia. Yeah, the title is Ali Shariati and the Future of Social Theory. Ali Shariati and the Future of Social Theory. Religion, Revolution, and the Role of the Intellectual. Is the title of the book. And uh, there are articles from a number of us, and uh, my address at the Shariati conference is in that book. I found that conference very interesting for two reasons, and I want to conclude on that note, because these two reasons also reflect what politics is and what politics can do to people. I found that conference interesting 
because, as I said a while ago, Shariati, such a huge influence upon the intellectual dimensions of the Iranian Revolution, and everyone would agree with this, and yet the man had been excluded totally from Iran and Iranian society after the revolution. His writings were, well, to all intents and purposes banned, though they didn't officially ban his writings. His writings were banned. His um, lectures, recordings of his lectures and so on were not properly arrived. Of course, he had died in 1977 before the revolution, but no attention at all to the man. His family members lived outside Iran, actually, for a long while. The daughter, sociologist, Sarah Shariati, son, philosopher, also lived outside Iran. And the family was totally blocked out. And this, I think, is the tragedy in many societies, in many societies, something we must keep in mind. And whenever I meet young people, I try to convey this message. Do never allow this sort of thing to happen in your society. Because it's sometimes through our indirect endorsement that things like this happen in our society. We don't stand up, we don't speak up, we don't fight this sort of a trend. This is a very, very dangerous trend. Imagine a revolution which uh, cherished freedom. In the end, it denied freedom to so many important individuals. And that continues to happen in Iran today, in spite of all the other achievements of its revolution. And there are achievements which we cannot deny. But today, you'll find that in Iran, it is sad. A person like Mohammad Khatami, who was part of the revolution, was president for more than eight years highly respected politician in Iranian society up to this day. He's blocked completely. You can't publish his speeches. You can't talk about his writings. He is not invited, radio, television, nothing. See, this is something that we have to keep in mind. We must learn how to accept dissent. And that is a very important point that one wants to make except dissent, meaning difference, differences in point of view, differences about how we look at society, even if those differences are totally abhorrent to us. We just can't accept those differences. We must learn how to accept differences. Unfortunately, there are not many Muslim societies that are able to accept differences. And the Iranian example, the Iranian experience, and the experience of many other societies show us that uh, we have to mature, we have to grow up. Even in our own country, friends, I think we have to learn how to mature. Just because we have elections, because we have opposition and so on, it doesn't mean that we understand the role of dissent in society. I don't think we understand. But we're not as bad as many other societies, Malaysia. Believe me, if you look at many other societies, it's so much worse. But keep this in mind, the respect for dissent, very, very important. And linked to that is the other principle. The reason why dissent is not respected is partly because we don't understand the importance of accountability. That leadership means accountability. For someone who came from a different religious background, one of the things that impressed me so much about Islam, Islam as a philosophy, Islam in terms of its ideas, was its emphasis upon accountability. The whole of our life, the whole of our lives as human beings, is linked to accountability. You have to be accountable in every sense of the word. Accountability is so important. And how is it that this civilization, that this tradition has succeeded in marginalizing accountability in politics all over the world? In so many countries, you don't acknowledge the importance of accountability. When you have power, you have to be accountable. 
when you have power, you have to ensure that you don't do anything that is wrong. Even if the people don't know that it's wrong, you shouldn't do things that are wrong. You have to be accountable. And I want to share with you a story that many people don't know, but it is something that is written about our own history. I think we had leaders at one time who understood what accountability was. And we don't really value their contribution from that point of view. What's the example I have in mind? You know, in 1959, 1959, you won't get this in most of the books, our Prime Minister at that time, Malaya, at that time the Prime Minister, Tunko Rahman, first Prime Minister, he stepped down as Prime Minister for a few months in 1959. Why? Why did he spend, step down? Because he wanted to spend time building up his political party, that is the alliance, which in the state elections, at that time state elections were held separately from federal elections, you know, at that time. Until recently, you know, we did not do this sort of thing, but state elections were held before federal elections. And the alliance, and his party in particular, AMNO, the lead party in the alliance, did badly in the 1959 elections in two states, the most Malay states, Klantan and Trangana. They lost in both those states. So the Tunku was very worried. He wanted to build up his party strengthen his party and he told his colleagues and he told the whole nation in a radio broadcast I'm stepping down as Prime Minister because I want to spend my time energy building up the party after its uh, defeat in two states and reporters asked him why can't you continue as Prime Minister at the same time he said no it won't be right because I'll be taking a salary that I'm not entitled to you see I'm about to finish. So this is what accountability is, a very, very important principle. You know, it is something that we don't even talk about because the people have come after him and some people, you know, who are in power and so on, they will feel embarrassed talking about things like this. But he had a very acute sense of what accountability meant. Of course, you know, they will say things about him, oh, he was a playboy, prime minister and so on, you know, but they forget. And this is the complexity of the human being. Sometimes you have people who may do things which uh, you may not uh, agree with and may not even be right in a certain sense, but nonetheless, they are human beings with good values, with sterling qualities. And This is an example. He valued accountability. And we have kept to that to some extent here and there, you know, accountability and so on. And I think uh, that's happening even now to some extent. I was glad when our 10th Prime Minister, when he took office, he said that uh, he would not take the official salary. Small thing, but still important. You know, so these are things which we have to develop and strengthen in our society. Accountability is very, very important. The budget is an example of our accountability. We present the budget. We have a development plan. That's also accountability. These things are part of accountability. And there are many other dimensions of accountability. We have to regard these as the most important dimensions of politics, especially for young people. Don't think that the most important dimension of politics is uh, getting a seat, <laughs> yeah? becoming a young Berhormat. Yeah? That is a sad thing. We value those things as politics. Even worse, you know, when I was leading another NGO many, many years ago, one of my colleagues, a teacher, he told me that uh, when he asked his students, these were students who were in the lower forms, you know, secondary school, what they wanted to be when they grew up, and a number of them said they wanted to be politicians. And he asked them why. Well, we can make money. <laughs> that was the answer. We can make money, we can become rich. This was about uh, 30 years ago. I think now the situation is much worse. Many people get into politics because they want to become rich, wealthy, or they want to enjoy enjoy the perks of power, like you know, say being prime minister. You know, the example I gave of the Rahman, right? He was prepared to give up that position. 
This, I think, is something very, very fundamental. Accountability and dissent. That, to my mind, are the defining attributes of politics. Dissent, respect for dissent, basically differences of opinion, and respect for accountability, and practicing accountability in every sense of the word. If we can do that, and we don't have to look for examples from the West or the North or South or East or whatever. If you look at our own history, and if you look at the history of Islam, these two attributes were there. Descent, where even an ordinary woman could stand up and challenge the second caliph when he gave a public uh, lecture, challenged him and what he was saying. And in the case of accountability, it's just amazing. Again, Saidina Umar, the example of accountability, the garment that he was wearing, he had to explain to the people because someone told him, look, how could you have made this uh, garment of yours because the ration that uh, you had imposed would not have been enough. To, but he said, I had to borrow the cloth from my son. And many, many other examples, friends, of uh, accountability. I say this because when I mentioned this to a leader of an Islamic party in Malaysia a long time ago, this is before I went into politics, and to make that very, very clear, I was there to talk to him as a person that I knew, and I mentioned this important principle of accountability and why he should give emphasis to accountability and dissent. You know, his response was, I'll say this in English, but it was in Malay, he said, where are the Muslim examples? Are there Muslim countries that have done this? I said, unfortunately, at the moment, no. And, and then I gave a few examples. I mentioned Sweden, I mentioned New Zealand. And New Zealand is the first country in the world, you know, to have introduced ombudsman, the concept of the ombudsman. So I gave these examples, and he said, these are kafir countries. Now, this is not an Islamic attitude. In Islam, the example, the principle, that is what counts. Why should we adopt that sort of attitude? This is the problem. So we have to change our thinking. So when we talk about an autonomous tradition, politics, as something that we want to evolve and develop, we have to keep these things in mind. The vital principles, the critical values that we should adhere to, and at the same time, drawing from our rich tradition. The tradition is there, but that tradition has been sidelined partly because of those who have got into power, and partly because of the way our societies have developed, the colonial past, the present, and all the rest of it. But your generation, you have a challenge before you. You have a challenge before you. Draw out the principles, adhere to the values that count, and these are universal values. And at the same time, draw out the best from your past. Thank you.